All right, hi friends. Thank you so much for continuing to stay with us as we continue our series on the sanctuary service. As we usually do, I invite you to bow your heads with me and close your eyes as we have a word of prayer. Loving Father, as we open your word today, please, dear God, send your Holy Spirit to teach us your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, today we want to move into the final apartment of the, of the sanctuary so as to discover the lessons that God wanted to teach us um, and as he taught the Israelites in this, the last part of the sanctuary called the most holy place. Now, beyond the altar of incense, there was a veil and this veil, which really was a curtain, separated the holy place from the most holy place of the sanctuary. And in the most holy place of the sanctuary, according to Exodus chapter 25, verses 10 to 22, we would find the Ark of the Testimony. Now the Ark of the Testimony was a, a, a chest, was a big box made of acacia wood. And this wood was overlaid with gold. On top of that chest, or the covering of the chest, uh, there were two angels made of solid gold and their wings would meet in the middle. The cover of the ark was called the mercy seat. So that's the cover of this box of the ark was called the mercy seat according to Exodus 25 verses 17 to 22. And between the angels and the covering, there was a mysterious light that was there. It was not a light that was lit by the priests it was a light that god himself placed there in fact that light was called the shekinah glory it was a physical evidence a physical representation that god was present in the sanctuary this of course uh most holy place of the sanctuary was supposed to be a replica or a reflection of the throne in heaven where God himself dwells, where the angels are there surrounding the throne, witnessing all the acts and actions that God engages in, as well as, of course, taking instructions from God whenever he has work for them to do. So, what was the significance of this ark? Well, in order to understand this full significance of the ark, we need to uh, first talk about what was inside of the ark. According to Exodus 25 and verse 21, we read, the Bible says, You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I will give you. Deuteronomy chapter 10 verses 4 and 5 confirms that God wrote on the tablets according to the first writing, the Ten Commandments which the Lord had spoken to you in the mountain from the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. And the Lord gave them to me, Moses speaking. Then I turned and came down from the mountain and put the tablets in the ark which I had made. Now Exodus 25, 21 said that he put the testimony in the ark. And here in Deuteronomy chapter 10 verses 4 and 5, he is saying that he put the tablets on which God had written the Ten Commandments in the ark and there they are he said just as the lord commanded me so what was inside of the ark the ten commandments also called the testimony so inside the ark god placed the only thing in all of scripture that was ever written with the finger of god the ten commandments these were placed inside of the ark so these Ten Commandments must have been extremely important. I mean, they are placed directly where the presence of God is. His throne, as I said, is represented by the mercy seat where the Shekinah glory is. And, and right inside of the box are with the Ten Commandments. So these Ten Commandments must have been extremely important to God. Why are the Ten Commandments extremely important to God? Well, in this study, we will learn why satan hates god's laws you know one of the subtle ways that he has brought or he has sought to discredit god's law 
has been to the suggestion that because we are saved by grace through faith, there is no need for the laws of God anymore. The, the commandments are done away with. In fact, some people boastfully proclaim. But is that the, what the Bible teaches? Is this what God intended? I mean, these commandments were placed inside of the ark in the most holy place. And if they were so important and so significant, they were written on stone actually by God's own finger. And if they were so important, if God considered them so important, then, then, then the question is, why? Well, according to 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4, the Bible gives us a definition for the one thing that God hates, the one thing that will separate us from God. What is that? That thing is sin. For we are told in Isaiah chapter 50, 59 that sin separates us from God. And of course, we know that the world has been plunged into the chaos that we exist, exist in today because of sin. So what is sin according to the Bible? Well, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4 tells us that sin is the transgression or the breaking of the law. 1 John chapter 3 verse 4. Sin is the transgression of the law. Now, which law is it that the Bible talks about when it's dealing with sin as the transgression of the law? Well, Paul in Romans chapter 7 and verse 7 says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. So the law is not sin. On the contrary, he says, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. Now I want you to take note of the, of, of, of the commandment that he's quoting. He said, I would not have known sin except the law had said, you shall not covet. I will not know what covetousness is. Now, now which law contains a command against coveting? Of course, it's the Ten Commandments, as recorded in the book of Exodus chapter 20. Those Ten Commandments that, that God wrote with His own finger, that He put inside of the ark, tells us what sin is. So the law points out sin. It reveals what sin is. Now, if there is no law, then we would not know what sin is. We would wonder, we would speculate, we would assume. But we don't need to do all of those things because the law tells us what sin is and that's why the law is important romans chapter 6 verses 1 and 2 says what shall we say then shall we continue in sin that grace may abound god forbid how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein what is the point that paul is making here you see you see when christ came he came to save us from sin and we established that in the previous presentation if he saves us from our sin, and sin is the transgression of the law, and the law is the Ten Commandments, and he saves us from sin, what grace does is give us the power not to break the law, but to keep the law. And that's the point that Paul is making here in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. No, we should not continue in sin, simply because there is grace. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? You see, you see, for those of us who are in, in, in intimate relationships, you know, we have a significant other. We are married, some of us, or some of us are co in courtship, courting to be married. If you're doing something and your loved one points out to you that, hey, you see what you're doing there? I don't like it. It is hurting me. You're breaking my heart. Would you continue to do it? Because the person may have forgiven you for doing it? No. When you are forgiven, what you would want to do now is to stop doing it so that, so that you can make the person happy. And that's what grace does. Grace provides us with pardon and forgiveness so that we can keep the law holy. And that makes sense. You see, Romans chapter 3 verse 20, continue, Paul continues the same argument. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. You see, the law does not save us. That's why we are not justified by keeping the law. You can keep the law how much you want. It will never make up for the wrongs that we would have already done. And the reality is that even we, though we try in our best efforts to keep the law, we cannot keep the law. That's why God has to come into our hearts and He has to keep the law in us and through us. And then, of course, what He does is that He gives us credit. 
you know, so people look at us and they think, oh, I'm a good man. You know, that's a good man. Yeah, he's an obedient man to God. No, we know, those of us who have been walking this road, we know that if it were up to us, we would not keep the law. But the Holy Spirit dwells within us and he keeps the law through us. Gives us the power to do it. That's what we established already. That's how we are sanctified by the Holy Ghost. He keeps the law in us. And that's what happens. So, so we, but we're not keeping the law because we are trying to earn our salvation. No. Our salvation, according to 1 John 1, 7, is by the blood of Jesus Christ. Because it is the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, 1 John 1, 7 says, that cleanses us from all sin. We are cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. But we keep the law because we have been cleansed. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 clearly states, that by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So, so the New Testament is absolutely clear about how we are saved. We are saved through the blood of Jesus Christ by His grace. The issue, however, is when you are saved, are the laws of God significant and important? And the answer is yes. A hundred times yes. I mean, if you were speeding down the highway, as, as so many of us do, and a police um, pull us over, and he says to you, listen, you've been, you've been speeding, and um, you deserve to get a ticket. And then he says, but I will show you mercy this time. I will show you grace. What will you then do? Drive off and go speeding again? If you do that and that police officer catches you speeding again, what do you think he's going to do with you this time? Do you think he's going to leave you to be free? Or do you think he's going to enforce the penalty for breaking the law this time? Of course he will enforce the penalty. Well, you see, it's a similar thing with God. When God forgives you for your sin, which is breaking his law, then God expects that you will do all within your power to obey. And of course, we know that we don't have to do it all within our own power because we have help from God. So God forgives us and then He gives us help so that we can keep the law holy. Isn't that a wonderful, merciful, gracious, fantastic God? I tell you, God is a good God. Yes, He is, the song says. So that's the New Testament. But some people say the law was, a, was an Old Testament thing and grace is a New Testament thing. But is that what the Bible reveals? Let's take a look at it. According to Exodus chapter 20 and verse 2, God, when He came to give to the Israelites the Ten Commandments, He began by saying the following. He said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And then... He gave them the Ten Commandments. So in his preamble, or as his reason, you, you know, for giving them the Ten Commandments, God says to them, listen, I'm giving you these Ten Commandments because of the fact that I am the one who brought you out of Egypt. I am the one who brought you out of bondage. I have set you free, and because I've set you free, I want you to, to maintain your freedom. In order to maintain your freedom, then I want to give you these principles by which you should live, these principles by which you should establish your society, these principles, you know, which are not simply ethical principles, but they are moral principles. If you live by these principles, you will be able to continue to be a free nation. So God gave them the commandments after he freed them. This same thought was already expressed in Exodus chapter 19 verses 4 and 5 where God said to the Israelites, I am the one that bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice. So God wanted them to obey because of what he had already done for them. He had set them free. He had blessed them. And God says, listen, because of what I've already done for you, because of the freedom that I've given you, obey what I tell you to do. Jeremiah 31, 2 reverberates the same thought where Jeremiah says, Thus said the Lord, the people which were left of the sword found grace in the wilderness. Talking about the Israelites, even Israel. The Israelites found grace 
in the sight of God. And because they experienced the grace of God, God then said to them, now that you have experienced my grace, walk in obedience to my commandments. So you see, in the Old Testament, the law was given not in order to save them, but because they had experienced salvation. Are you getting it, my friends? Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 5 and 6. We are told, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. Now, 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 most of you would recognize that this is what Jesus quoted in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37, when he was presented with this question about the two commandments, which are the two great commandments. You know, that lawyer who thought he was a bright fellow, trying to trick Jesus, came and asked him, which is the greatest commandment? And Jesus quoted this, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And of course, Jesus also continued and said to him, that the second commandment is, 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 is like the first one, which is, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, quoting Leviticus 19 and verse 18. How is it that Jesus was quoting, was saying that the, 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 the law, the commandments, is about loving God firstly, with all your heart, your soul, and your mind, and then loving your neighbor as yourself? But you see, first of all, when you really examine the Ten Commandments, these are principles that when carried out will be a demonstration of care care for god and then care for fellow men because if you love and care for your fellow human beings you won't take another man's wife you won't steal that which another person owns you will not kill somebody you, 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 you're with me brother friends of mine because you see you see you see you see the bible is clear that, that the obedience to the laws of God is not the result of some arbitrary uh, or, or some dogmatic or di dictatorial, dictatorial God. No, 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 no. God gave us his commandments because he loves us. And he wants us to keep his commandments because we love him. And we love our fellow human beings. So you see, the commandments is really a love thing. Is not a legalistic thing. You do it out of love for God and love for your fellow human beings. And that's why Micah chapter 6 verse 8 makes it absolutely clear. Micah chapter eight, 6 verse 8 says, He has shown you, woman, man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? What does the Lord require? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. You see, you see, God does not want us to keep his law because we are afraid of him or because we are trying to earn his favor or we're trying to impress him. No, 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 no. God wants us to keep his law because we love him and we are walking humbly with him. Because you see, the law is about demonstrating mercy and doing justly. And that's why when we experience the new birth, when God cleanses us from sin and takes away our old man and gives us a new man, the Old Testament in Ezekiel 36, 26 and 27 says, God says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, transformation that God makes. And, and, and in fact, that's what the society really needs. The society needs a, a, a transformation. And the only way we can be transformed is if God intervenes and gives us this new heart and put a new spirit within us. But you see, God is a gentleman. He will not bombard and, 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 and come into us without our permission. That's why he stands at the door according to Revelation chapter 3. And he is knocking. He's knocking. And he says, if any man opens the door, I will come in and sup with him. Ezekiel in the Old Testament said that God said, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. He said, I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And hear what he says. I will put my spirit within you and cause you. So he will cause you. He will empower you. He will make you, in other words, walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. What are the statutes? The statutes, of course, are his laws, his commandments. So when we experience the new birth, what God does is give us a new heart, a new spirit, and he gives us the power 
to help us to obey his commands. In fact, he is the one that is causing us, the Bible says, to do it. Now, this is the Old Testament. That is Old Testament. So you see, in the Old Testament, salvation was really based on faith, experienced through the grace of Almighty God. He was the one who was doing it in the Old Testament. And so he is the one also that is doing it in the New Testament. We are also told in Matthew 19, 17, Jesus said, if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. He also repeated in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. And we are told in Revelation 22, 14, the last book, the last chapter, almost the end of the Bible, blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. So the people who are going to be saved in the last days, when Jesus comes, are described as people who are keeping the commandments. And 1 John 2, 3 and 4 says, Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him. So, so this person said, I know Jesus. And knowing him here means I'm in a relationship with him. He's my savior. He's my Lord. He's my best friend. He's my everything. He says, he who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. Now, those are not my words. Those are not Pastor MacMillan's words. Those are the words of the Holy Scriptures. 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. So if people are saying, I know Jesus. I am a Christian. I'm living for Jesus. But they are not keeping His commandments. The Bible says that those people are liars. And there are some people who say, okay, okay, the commandments to refer to here are the commands that Jesus Himself gave specifically. But wasn't it Jesus who gave the Ten Commandments? Of course! And while Jesus was on earth, did, didn't Jesus say that we ought to keep the commandments? Of course, and we already said that already in, in the text we quoted. Jesus, so Jesus' commandments include the Ten Commandments. Of course, what Jesus did was help us humanity to understand the full impact, the full application of the commandments. Take, for example, the command not to commit adultery. Now, some people thought that committing adultery was only the physical act. But Jesus explained that a man commits adultery not only when he commits the literal act, but he commits adultery when he commits the act in his mind. When he looks at a woman and performs the act in his mind, he has committed adultery also. So what Jesus did was elaborate, was explain the meaning, the full meaning of the Ten Commandments. Are you with me, friends? Am I? But he didn't get rid of it. He didn't get rid of it. So if anybody says, I know Jesus, I'm living for Jesus, I'm a disciple of Jesus and doesn't keep the commandments, the Bible says that that person is a liar and the truth is not in him. Those are not my words. Those are the words of Jesus. So if I'm going to be a real Christian, I ought to keep the commandments. Amen. And in the last days, the devil is angry with a special group of people. Who are those people that the devil is angry with? Well, Revelation 12, 17 says that the dragon or the devil was wroth with the woman, the church, and went to make war with the remnant of a seed, God's end time faithful people. And hear how they're described. These remnant, the last group of people who, who God will claim as his own, are described as keeping the commandments of God and having the testimony of Jesus Christ. So God's last day people are going to keep the commandments. And so Hebrews 13, 8 declares, because, see, some people feel that God says one thing here and another thing there. Hebrews 13, 8 says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. God does not change. Malachi 3, 6 says, I am the Lord, I change not. Jesus, when he was on earth, said in Matthew 5 17 he said do not think don't even think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets I did not come to destroy the law nor the prophets but to fulfill of course Jesus is using the word law here in its broader meaning as the first five books of the Bible the Torah but inside of the Torah are the Ten Commandments and so what Jesus was establishing was, I did not come to get rid of what God had already established through Moses or through the prophets. 
I came to fulfill it. And some people say, well, Pastor, fulfill means to get rid of. But how could fulfill mean to get rid of? Because Jesus said, do not think I came to destroy the Lord of prophecy. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. If fulfill means to get rid of, then fulfill means to destroy. So how could he say, I came to destroy it, but I didn't come to destroy it? That doesn't make sense. That's why he said, I didn't come to destroy it, but I came to fulfill it. What does the word fulfill mean in this context? It means that he came to demonstrate to us how to keep the law. So when we want to know how to keep the commandments, what we need to do is look at Jesus. What we need to do is follow Jesus. And so Luke 16, 17 says that it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tittle of the law to fail. A tittle was considered to be, to be, to be a small punctuation. And he said, listen, not even a tittle, huh? not even a tittle of the law is going to fail. And so friends of mine, that's why in the most holy place of the sanctuary, in that box called the ark, inside of that ark, God had Moses put the Ten Commandments written, written by his very finger. I mean, if I wrote a letter to my wife expressing to her my love and my desire, and she cherishes that letter, what would she do with it? She would put it somewhere to keep it special so that it will not, be, it will not deteriorate, you know, so that she could refer to it from time to time, especially if, if we have to depart one from the other. That's what God did with the Ten Commandments. He gave it to the Israelites and He wanted them to treat it such, as such a, a special gift to them that He told them, listen, put it inside of the ark. So in the most holy place, we encounter the Ten Commandments. And so friends of mine, my question to you today is, having recognized that the law of God is important, having recognized that the law points out sin, it doesn't save you from sin, but it points it out. Having recognized that God, when He saves you, wants you to stop committing sin, which is He wants you to stop breaking the law. Having recognized that God says, you don't have to keep the law on your own, I will help you to do it. Will you make a commitment, my friend, to keeping the commandments of God? If you're making that commitment today, why not pick up your phone and give us a call? Send us a message on WhatsApp or, or a text message or, or, or go to our Facebook page. Look for, for Kevin McMillan or look for Loud Cry Heralds and message us. Send us a message. Let us know that you are committing yourself to keeping the laws of God. And in addition to that, friends of mine, there are Seventh-day Adventist churches scattered throughout this island. Why not find one of them and go join with them and join a group of people who are keeping the commandments of God so that you can be encouraged, you can be strengthened, and you can even be educated so as to how to keep the commandments of God. And if you don't mind the long drive, then come up to Sangri Grandi where we are in the coca, where we have our, our school of evangelism there. And come, we will teach you how to keep the commandments of God. Or sometimes I might be at Southeast Church and uh, as one of the churches that I attend and, and you can be there to find out how to keep the commandments of God because we want to help you. We have experienced the power of God and I'm so grateful that God is keeping us faithful so that we don't have to commit adultery, we don't have to commit murder, we can worship God as He requires us to worship because of the power that He has given to us to keep His commandments. He has saved us and because He has saved us, we are free. And because we are free, we continue to walk in our freedom by walking in obedience.